Cloud. Good afternoon and welcome everyone for to this session in which we discuss uh, the global uh, financial safety net. And this is a part of a project uh, that UNCTAD has been uh, collaborating with some of the speakers you'll see here today. Um, it's a project uh, that is part of the development account projects that the UN has established. And this particular one was around uh, reacting to the COVID pandemic. Um, so it began, in fact, in uh, May of 2020. And the idea behind this project was to try and enable policymakers um, have access to differentiated and new tools that would give them better insights when trying to manage and design solutions uh, that the pandemic imposed upon their economies. And one of the very important ones that has come out of this project is this Global Financial Safety Net Tracker. Um, we have um, today a, a very distinguished panel. We have uh, welcomes from both Richard Kozel Wright, who is the director of um, the Division on Globalization and Development Strategies. We have Kevin Gallagher, who is the head of the Policy um, Center at Boston University. And we have Barbara Fritz and Larissa Mulich, who will actually be presenting uh, the paper on this global financial safety net. Some of the, the outcomes of their painstaking work of examining who has access to what safety net in the global financial system. And thereafter, we have two very important speakers. Uh, we have Jean Paulo Panchera, who is speaking to us from the Central Bank of Brazil, and Candelaria Moroni, who is the Under Secretary for International Coordination in the Ministry of Economy in Argentina. So having said that, welcome again. May I ask that you do keep yourself muted. This is a meeting, and so there will be an opportunity for you to raise your questions in person um, towards the end of the session. So may I please just hand over immediately um, to Richard, who would welcome everybody. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Penelope, and, and welcome to everybody. Nice to see you all. Um, I don't have a lot to say. Obviously, these are issues we've been working on uh, both separately and closely with uh, BU. Kevin will maybe say a little bit more about that. I mean, I'm still trying to digest what happened at was in Washington at the IMF World Bank meetings. And obviously, the work that we do here speaks directly to to some of those discussions. And I, you know, I think the, the kind of disturbing thing coming out of Washington was the kind of the disconnect essentially between the rhetoric of, a, of another and in some respects an even more threatening crisis for many developing countries coming on top of not only the, the pandemic, but also the lingering consequences of the global financial crisis, which itself was never resolved uh, properly. Uh, and the and the lack of essentially the lack of ideas about about what to do about about dealing with this kind of global emergency. Um, there was some talk from the IMF about its um, its uh, resilience and sustainability trust, uh, which is going to kick in at some point later this year, with some as yet to be determined. Um, uh, level of capital um, issues of of whether you need a program to be able to access it or not unresolved. I mean, essentially unresolved, but but fundamentally not dealing with the immediate crisis that developing countries, many developing countries, are, are facing as a consequence of the uh, blowback from from the events in in, in Ukraine. Um, on on so that no no real resolution. The World Bank has suggested it has a fair amount of firepower to throw at the problem. There's a talk of $170 billion, but, but no one's quite sure even what that means and whether it, this is accessible or how accessible it is, how much of this is new capital, et cetera. Um, and, and, and a complete refusal to discuss issues around uh, debt, uh, restructuring debt sustainability, the G20 can't even 
do the minimum of extending the debt service suspension in initiative. There's a kind of group speak about the need to uh, strengthen the common framework, but no one knows what that means as a common framework so far has had three countries kind of sign up to it and, and only one that kind of is inching towards some sort of uh, actual arrangement. So there's no, there's, there's, there just seems to be a, a level of fatigue amongst the amongst the uh, uh, IFIs, which is, is quite disturbing. The issue, of course, of special drawing rights, even, even though that was a very important outcome of the, of the, of the response to the pandemic, um, the issue of recycling special drawing rights has not been resolved in any, in any way. And in some respects, talking to some people in the, in the US, there's actually more chance of a new issuance of special drawing rights than there is of act actually recycling special drawing rights that are not being used by countries that don't need them. So it was a, it was a real feeling of, of kind of disconnect that I certainly came out in Washington and the need for new ideas, the need for, for fresh thinking, the need for better data. And, and I hope in many respects, what we'll hear today is beginning to push the boat out in the direction of some some fresh thinking on on responding on being able to respond to this this kind of uh, crisis. I mean, there's a whole lot of issues about reform of the financial architecture that UNCTAD has been banging on about for a long time. Kevin may say something also about that in the work that they do, but we're not even talking about that. We're we're essentially trying to get the system as it is to live up to its responsibilities of, of dealing with a global crisis of the kind that, that, that we are seeing now. And, and, and you know, at the, at the moment, I think failing, failing to do so. Um, so, so, you know, that's, that's kind of where my head still is coming out of the, of the, Washington, of, of the Washington meetings. And, and I think hoping that the kind of work that we've been doing can begin to, to provide some Fresh thinking on 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 what needs to be done because I'm I'm not convinced that the either the fund or the bank at this moment in time is capable of of, of, of pushing things out. Kevin, I don't know what you want to add to that. Thanks, Richard, and and thanks, uh, Penelope. It's it's great to be here, and it's it's great to be, I guess, now in our in our third year of collaboration on the uh, UNCTAD Free University of Berlin and and Boston University GDP Center. Global Financial Safety Net uh, Safety Net Tracker, where I guess when we, as Penelope said in, in her opening remarks, when we first started about thinking about this project, we thought about the COVID crisis, uh, which of course we're we're still in the middle of. I just returned from Africa, uh, where I picked up the the latest variant and haven't been in the office for a week, uh, so that is still uh, very much uh, at the very front of of us all from a from a health perspective, but also as it accentuates uh, fiscal space and and uh, and 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 global liquidity, uh, obviously we we're we're in a, in a larger context now. In fact, the, the developing world really stands at a precipice where they're standing and staring out at at sort of three crises: right, financial instability and liquidity squeezing, food, fuel, and health, and climate change. And before Putin's war in Ukraine in in January, the World Bank had actually sounded the alarms that we'd have a significant liquidity and debt crisis just from potential interest rate rises in the North uh, that would lead to a stop in capital flows, capital flight that would, uh, that would put what they estimated to be around 60 plus countries that were already in debt distress uh, over, over the edge. Well, those, those rate hikes and that fiscal tightening is, is, is upon us. Uh, in, in the North, in the U.S., uh, getting more bold, and the ECB now uh, also uh, moving to moving to join. Uh, but this has been accentuated and compounded many times over uh, by the sanctions and, and subsequent squeeze and fuel, fuel, food and fuel prices. And capital flight is among us, with uh, the dollar appreciating daily, the uh, Chinese uh, renminbi depreciating daily which uh, puts a big drag on emerging market and developing country uh, currencies, which is ballooning their debt and squeezing what little uh, space that they've had over the past two years. So even more than in 2020, when we started this project, 
uh, emerging market and developing countries face massive liquidity shortages, facing trade-offs over paying foreign debt versus feeding their people versus purchasing fuel uh, versus uh, addressing new waves of, of the COVID. And this is in the midst of of uh, climate news that we hear every day. The Financial Times reported yesterday that in the Horn of Africa, they're experiencing the, uh, a four decade, uh, the worst drought in four decades, which is putting even more of a pinch on, on food. Uh, in Durban, South Africa, where I just came back from, they have massive floods at the most important, uh, most important port, which is choking off major uh, supply chains uh, and so forth. Uh, also, the internet, uh, the IPCC reports on climate change that just came out have showed us that we need to be mobilizing uh, trillions of dollars to recover in a way that bends down uh, uh, carbon emissions by 40% by 2030. So this all just doesn't, just doesn't add up. We need emerging market and developing country mobilizations of trillions of dollars for these immediate liquidity needs, for immediately to be able to get food, fuel, and healthcare to people across the world, and to mount a recovery that changes the structure of our economies across the world in a way that's green, more inclusive, uh, and more growth enhancing for emerging market and developing countries. Uh, as our friends will, will uh, uh, our collaborators will reveal to you in the latest uh, rendition of the Global Financial Safety Net Tracker is that just on the liquidity piece of this, the system is not fit for purpose in terms of its scale, in terms of its composition and its geographical, uh, geographical spread. Um, while, uh, while I agree that uh, with, with with Richard's remarks, I think this project is really important uh, and deserves a, a lot of amplification to be able to really show this. Um, and that I, I do have two glimmers of hope that came out of Washington. Uh, like Richard mentioned, Janet Yellen uh, in her Atlanta Council speech, it's becoming really famous, has, uh, has called for a transformative set of reforms at the IMF and the World Bank. Luckily, she only had one paragraph and our job in this project definitely addresses one of the paragraphs that needs to come after that, which is the scale of the system uh, and the comprehensive of this, of this system. And that this project and this group is poised to really amplify and uh, put voice to that part of the second paragraph. Uh, relatedly, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm impressed by, the, by, by parts of the communiques of the G24 and the V20 um, calling for quota-based increases in the International Monetary Fund by 2023. The IMF last communique, obviously we didn't have one in April because of, uh, because of the G7 walkout, but the last one, at least on paper, commits to a quota-based increase in the scale of the IMF by, uh, by December of, of 2023. And there was allowed uh, recognition that this needs to be this needs to happen. It was uh, it was uh, it was kicked down the road. It did not. The last quarter reform did not happen. Uh, I don't see how, in the midst of what has been going on over the past two years, that the North can get away with with uh, with denying an, another quarter increase. And this project and this particular tracker really shows that need and should be a core sort of bedrock for that analysis for developing countries as they develop proposals at the fund uh, for this quota reform. So I've been, uh, it's been great to be part of this. Uh, this project is more important now than, than, it, than it was in the very beginning. I wanna applaud the folks uh, uh, who've, been, who've been really in, involved in, in the middle of this and, and Larissa and Barbara uh, and William Kring and, and of course, our friends on the on the UNCTAD side. I'll pass it off to my friends. But the big question I have is: Can we capitalize, literally and figuratively, uh, on this crisis, uh, or are we going to kick this one down the road like we like we have? Uh, we can't afford to. And I'm I'm empowered and inspired to be part of a, this collaboration that uh, is at least not going to uh, take the megaphone away of what the of what the of what the numbers say that really needs to be done. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you so much, Kevin. And indeed, thank you very much to the authors of this paper that we are going to present now. Um,
just so that nobody is left out, this paper was written by Larissa Muchek, who is here to present, Marina Suka Marquez, who is now part of the UNCTAD team, Barbara Fritz, and William Kring, who has been on paternity leave for a while, but great to have him, I did see his name briefly on the participant list. So welcome to you. I'm going to hand over now to Barbara, who's talking on No One Left Behind, COVID-19 and the shortcomings of the global financial safety net for low and middle income countries. Thanks, Barbara. Thank you, Penelope, for inviting us and for putting up that workshop. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, Larissa is putting up that presentation and thanks for uh, Kevin and Richard for this, for your introduction. Even if you picture a gloomy world in terms of precipitate, it's, it's difficult to hear me. Okay. Um, for even if you paint a picture of a uh, rather dark picture of uh, lack of reforms and the stacking of reforms in Washington and of a dire uh, world of upcoming three crises. Uh, there we are. Um, let me just, okay. So, um, as uh, Penelope said, we have here a group of people. This is a collaboration between the Boston University, the Global Development Policy Center, where Kevin is the director, and where uh, Bill Kring has, is having a key role. Frau Universität Berlin and Angtat has been funding that tracker. Okay, next slide, please, Larissa. Okay, first I will talk quickly about the Global Financial Safety Net, what that is. Instead of giving you a your definition, I show you the building up, the historical building up of that. First, in the post-World War, what you had was just the IMF as the global institution to provide countries with short-term liquidity when they had a balance of payments problem and with advice. Also with rather small volume. Next slide. In the 70s already, we had some events like the oil crisis, etc. And we had the upcoming of some regional funds. Regional fin financial arrangements, which is the red bu uh, bullet, are liquidity pools of mostly neighboring countries which joined foreign exchange reserves um, and lent these to the member countries in case of financial crisis. These are what we have here, different in terms of, of volume and have different governance mechanisms. Next. Today, we have a, high, a big and highly complex system. Um, it's, um, the regional financial arrangements, you see, it, it's a much larger number of, uh, uh, of, of RFAs, what you see here. Um, we have an IMF, which now has increased its lending volume, still maybe too small, but now it's one trillion of dollar. RFAs also can offer in their total one trillion of dollars. And then you have a third a new element which emerged, especially in the global financial crisis, which are bilateral central bank currency swaps, the blue uh, bullet. Uh, so what is that? Two central banks agree mutually that they will lend their own currency to the other central bank when there is a need uh, immediately. Um, so, um, this allows a country which is in problem to get liquidity in the currency of the other central bank. What we see here is that the IMF is no longer the only player in the game. Can developing countries and emerging market countries which have access to an RFA and or to a swap can solve their liquidity problems in various ways. Next, please. Larissa? Okay, um, the IMF has recently, very recently, in the last year, started also to do research on the global financial safety net, on this mix of institutions, different layers. You see here a high level uh, uh, publication they did last year, uh, where they come to similar results showing the increase overall of all elements of the global financial safety net. But what they do not do at the IMF is to look at the inequalities uh, of the different layers which are provided for developing emerging market countries. That's what we are doing uh, here with our exercise in the paper and in the tracker. Next, please. 
So first, when we look on the lending capacity of the global financial safety net as we have it today, today is end of 21, December 21. Um, what we see here is that um, first we use the same colors as in our uh, first bubble map, but we distinguish for the IMF, uh, which is green, the dark green, which is um, uh, standard conditional lending by the IMF, like standby agreements, and the light green are uh, is non-conditional lending from the IMF, which are new lines like really rapid financial instrument and others. We do a similar thing for swaps. These are blue again, but the dark uh, blue swaps are limited swaps and the light blue swaps, which you see for uh, high income countries are unlimited swaps, which the Federal Reserve offers for a very limited uh, gang of the five called group of, um, of, of highly advanced eco uh, economies um, to have access to uh, liquidity of the Federal Reserve. Um, okay, left you see um, the absolute value for income groups. Um, and you see that the volume of insurance strongly correlates with uh, the income level. The higher the income, the better the countries are protected. We have one group which, which is an exception, which is a very small group, the high income emerging market countries, which are mainly small island countries, which also always display a bit differently. At the right scale, you have uh, the volume displayed as percentage of GDP. You come to a similar result, the richer the country is, the better they are insured. Next slide, please. When we go for regions, um, you see that uh, some regions are much better insured than others. This is especially East Asia and Europe, which has a high, much, which have a much higher insurance level than the other regions, Latin America, Africa, and others. Okay, now I hand over to Larissa to introduce the tracker exercise per se. Thank you very much. Welcome everyone. I'm delighted to be invited here to present um, the GFS and the Global Financial Safety Net tracker to you, um, which we set up um, who? to track actual use in the Global Financial Safety Net since March 2020, since the onset of the global um, COVID-19 pandemic. Now, my computer does not want to work with me anymore. Uh, it seems to love Barbara's voice more than mine. I'm so sorry. So I can't go forward. So at the moment, um, since I have, since I want to work with them, um, can you see it now? Yeah, okay. So I'll try this way. Okay, sorry for that. Um, so this is the website um, that um, that we created jointly um, with um, with the, the global um, global development policy center, Bill, um, Bill Kring, and um, and Kevin and Marina and Barbara um, and uh, Josh, who um, actually uh, under um, who actually supported um, to visualize the database that we set up um, to get an understanding of the current use of the global financial safety net in times of the pandemic. Um, and uh, actually, if you if you go to this side, it allows you visualizing the borrowing strategy uh, since the onset of the pandemic for each and every UN member country. It also allows you showing it shows you the the potential borrowing amount that a country could draw. Uh, in reaction to liquidity crisis. And also from a more bird's eye perspective, it allows you uh, to have an analytical view on the complexities that Barbara outlined to you initially that we observe in the global financial safety net. Um, you can, if you uh, go into the website, you can hover over country, get ad additional um, in country information on each and every individual country, how it reacted to the COVID-19 pandemic from which source, with what amount, maturity, etc. And also you find here monthly tracking of the sum of actual loan or swap agreements with either the IMF in unconditional or conditional lending with regional funds, these regional financial agreements, arrangements and um, bilateral central bank currency swaps between March 2020 and uh, January 2022. This is when we stopped tracking the data so far. Um, we did 
I prepare for you some summary graphs on the active use of the global financial safety net during COVID-19. And I start here with the absolute figures. Between March 2020 and January 2022 in US dollar billion. And summed up, you see that the IMF did lend out uh, 172 billion US dollar out of its stated lending capacity of 1 trillion US dollar. For the regional funds, this was um, a lending volume of up to 6.6 .6 billion US dollar out of this summed up lending capacity of 1 trillion US dollar. And then we tracked um, a total figure of 1.24 trillion US dollar in active central bank current, um, sorry, in active central bank currency swaps. So in a nutshell, you see only of these sums um, that the demand from IMF and RFA lending, so from the multilateral sources that we know so far as being the global financial safety net, has been a small fraction of what they have as available resources. Second, the demand for IMF resources, and I will go into this in a, in a moment, is, um, is low, but um, on top of it, it's about 80% that was given out without standard conditions. The IMF, in reaction to COVID-19, as you all know, reformed its um, rapid access facilities um, to be of higher volume, to be accessible uh, for more countries, and um, for temp this is, has been initiated uh, for, um, I think, until June 2023. And um, these reform facilities were used extremely well, um, given the overall low use of the IMF, um, but these uh, were the focus of the lending activities so far. And this could tell us something about for suggestions for reform. Um, and third, swaps dominated the use of the global financial safety net so far, and this is mostly and exclusively the case for higher income group countries. So if you go to this graph now that uh, separates uh, the different uh, country income groups, um, you see that um, the upper middle income countries and high income countries uh, were exclusively or almost exclusively using bilateral instruments to react to COVID-19. Um, and in absolute terms, these funds have mainly gone to these two groups of countries, where we differentiate in high income emerging and advanced, you see a, a strong bias to our funds that have been go have gone to um, high income advanced economies in the form of bilateral instruments. Now, maybe more interesting is to look at these numbers in a relative dimension as percent of GDP. What you see here is, again, by country income groups, that an average high income advanced economy can access almost 11% of its GDP in the GFSN in reaction to COVID-19, or did actually do that, um, and exclusively in the form of bilateral central bank currency swaps, whereas an average low income economy accessed a little more than 2% of its GDP. Uh, and this is primarily from, from the IMF, and on top of all, primarily in the form of conditional, and partly only in the form of unconditional lending. So we have a huge gap, not only in terms of quantity, but also in terms of the form and of the quality of the liquidity that is that can be accessed and that was accessed actually in reaction to COVID-19. And then we see that it is mainly upper and higher income groups and emerging markets that relied on the IMF and the regional financial arrangements. Um, and so we see that for those countries, they do play a certain role. Right, you see that um, the use is quite different between the high income advanced economies and um, emerging markets. Now, again, um, we um, give you a different perspective by weighing those relative figures by country GDP. And if we apply this weighted GDP shares per income group, we see that those regional financial arrangements shares almost evaporate. So what we can take away from here is that those regional funds are probably more or are quite certainly more relevant to rather small countries in terms of GDP size. And it is the bigger emerging market economies that have access to, um, to bilateral currency um, sent to bilateral central bank currency swaps, um, and it is not the smaller ones in terms of GDP size. This is also true not only for um, those income groups, but also if we look into um, the weighted GDP shares of actual use of the global financial safety net by region, 
then we again see this um, a certain inequalities that seem to have a pattern. And here, what Barbara presented to you initially on um, the very high level of insurance or lending capacity that Southeast Asia and Europe can access, you find this again here in the actual use of the global financial safety net during COVID-19, um, where we have a higher access of those countries and a higher use of those countries and primarily through bilateral instruments. In fact, an exception is Latin America, where we have a disproportionately high bar here that is caused uh, not um, primarily because huge um, economies, relatively huge economies like Brazil, Argentina or Chile did have access to bilateral currency swaps um, by the Fed or by China. And so this kind of biases um, this picture here. Thank you very much, Barbara, over to you. Okay, as a, as a last point, we will go into uh, some more details relating the quality um, uh, of, of, this, uh, of this network. So I will quickly talk about the role of the swaps, open that black box of swaps and then re regional funds. Okay, first the, Larissa, could you go to the next? Okay, first to this uh, currency swap network. Um, what we see here is that, um, again, we have an inequality. Uh, you see the different uh, groups, income groups, the richer the countries are, the better they are insured. And these unlimited swaps, the light blue is concentrated on a small group of advanced economies like the uh, Euro era, uh, Great Britain, Switzerland, Japan. Um, and the others have limited swaps, but it's mostly emerging markets which have access uh, to these uh, swaps and developing countries have none. Um, next slide. Next, next slide. Okay, now we go into the display of which central banks are offering these swaps. We color coded these. Um, and we have two big players, which is the US, which is the dark blue, which is what the main provider at the global level of um, uh, currency swaps in China, which is uh, displayed in red. So <clears throat> um, we see that uh, China is offering uh, also um, swaps to developing countries to a certain degree um, and to uh, uh, emerging markets. But we also have a range of other advanced economies like J Japan, Canada, Australia, and all this, and even some emerging economies like especially Asia, but also Qatar, they have started to play an increasing role in offering bilateral swaps to specific uh, partner countries. Um, from the literature, we know that uh, these bilateral swap agreements are driven by domestic interests, interests of the dominating country, which is the, the one which most probably will lend out its domestic currency to the partner country. So it will be the US which will be lending to most of its partners, not the reverse, and the same for China. And uh, literature shows that the key interests here are trade and financial ties, but also geopolitical uh, motivations. Motivations. Um, we can see that the Fed has been using uh, the swap instruments as an active instrument to maintain international US dollar liquidity in the pandemic crisis. So it has turned a key instrument of international monetary policy of the Fed. Um, adjusting the volume over time. For example, in 2002, it decreased its volume and stopped uh, the swaps uh, towards uh, a group of emerging market uh, countries. Whilst China has a different rhythm. Uh, China had its climax of bilateral swaps offered to other countries in the midst of the 2010s. And since, since then it has been retreating a bit, but has been uh, constant in its offer of bilateral swaps over the pandemic. Next slide. When we look in the regional funds, which were which of these have been used during the pandemic, we see that the most used 
uh, regional fund has been the uh, set of institutions which provide European Union macrofinancial system to non-European -Euro Union, Eastern European countries. These really have been very much activated. Um, also uh, used, but a similar to the past has been the Arab Monetary Fund and a bit lesser than in the past, the Latin American Reserve Fund. Uh, both rather small, but always continuously important for especially small BEMBA countries since the 1970s. Um, less used, but still demanded have been uh, regional funds with uh, countries which are regionally dominant. For example, the Indian regional swap ag agreement SARC or the Eurasian fund uh, FSD where Russia is dominant and is playing as one of its instrument of neighboring uh, of neighbor policies. Um, so they have been somehow used as in the past, but a bit less not tapped as in the past are the big funds uh, which are Chiang Mai Initiative Multilateral and the uh, uh, Contingent Reserve Agreement of the BRIC countries which are the two big funds here in this group of regional funds but where the use uh, of these funds is uh, up from a certain uh, quota share of 30 or 40 percent is, uh, is, is linked to an IMF agreement to be in place. So it seems that as in the past these regional funds seem to suffer from the shadow of what we can call an IMF stigma and what the literature call this, calls this. Okay, to conclude. Um, first, uh, we have this inequality in terms of income level. Um, and we have also this inequality that uh, the, the poorer the countries get, the less diversified is their access to the GFSN sources. Uh, we have seen that uh, IMF conditional lending still in terms of volume is more relevant, uh, but uh, demanded, uh, we, in, in terms of demand, we have higher demand of unconditional lending, much higher. Um, um, what we also have with this increase of bilateral instruments and the increasing level of decoordination of global emergency finance. Um, we talked last year in the beginning of the pandemic when vaccines started to be produced, were very scarce about a vaccine diplomacy, where, for example, countries were offered uh, uh, vaccines when they were very small and uh, this could shape their voting behavior in the UN. Um, and what we see here is somehow a liquidity uh, diplomacy where national interests dominate more and more the display of short-term liquidity availability for countries. And as Kevin said, what we see here in terms of use might well be the calm before the storm because we know that capital flows will be reversing and more countries will enter most properly into financial distress. So the picture of use will uh, will, will start to change and it might well be uh, that um, that the uh, GFSN with all its inequalities will turn dysfunctional in its active use. Last slide now. Um, what are the policy challenges? What we see as one point is that regional funds are uh, certain, uh, certainly untapped resource of the global financial safety net. The smaller funds which are in use should find ways to increase their size. Um, some regions have no regional funds like Africa. Is there a way to create one? Um, is there a way to make uh, regional funds more autonomous and delink them from the IMF? And is there a need to rethink their mission away from pure balance of uh, payments finance also to fiscal support, financing of climate policy changes, etc.? Second, and this is important for the current discussion, the IMF needs reforms, not also only in terms of its volume, of its size, of its quota, of an SDR reallocation, but also in terms of its lending policies. We see that demand for conditional lending of the IMF still is very small, so stigma still rules. Countries do not want to go to the IMF for conditional lending if they can avoid it for some reason. So there is still and continues to be a strong need to overhaul conditionalities and to increase non, especially non-conditional lending. 
and as about SDR, Kevin and uh, Richard also ta already talked. The currency swaps need to become somehow part of the coordination of the global financial safety net. So bring the big central banks to the table of discussion of the global financial safety net. Um, uh, and we see this need to reduce the inequality as a last point. Uh, we displayed for income groups and for regions um, where a coordination of the different elements, especially uh, regarding regional funds, needs a coordination at eye level uh, using the comparative advantages of each of these elements. Thank you. I hand over to Penelope. Thank you very much. And thank you for not only the intense amount of work uh, that went into to gather this data. I know that you visited the central bank um, websites of every single country several times during this project. It's a huge undertaking um, and very, very thorough and an excellent presentation. I'm going to hand over now to our next guest, Juan Pablo Panchero, who is an advisor at the Central Bank of Brazil. Um, we'd very much like to hear from you. Thank you. Hello, thanks. And thanks for, for the invitation to, to comment this interest paper. So it's a pleasure to, to discuss so uh, important and hot topic in the global financial system, not in the, in the global economy. So let me share my, my presentation with a with few comments on this paper. Um, Thank you, we can see it. Can you see the, the presentation? Yes, indeed. Perhaps you can switch to presentation mode. Otherwise okay. you can still take, take us through, it looks very clear. Yeah. Go ahead, thank you. Okay, uh, the first thing is important to, to mention that uh, this view in this presentation does not represent necessarily the official view of the, the Brazilian Central Bank. So let's start. Uh, this project paper, I, I put some out, my major point that I, I think the, they are the most interesting for, for, for me. So this address very well the recent inequality among countries to access liquidity in the global financial markets. So it's, it's very important to, to point out this, this issue because the, the amount of liquidity since the global financial crisis has been increased uh, dramatically. All oh, these GFSN um, systematically has contributed to, as the paper point out, for the financial vulnerability of the lower uh, income countries and low middle income countries because of the way that the Barbara Fritz just showed to, to us, I think. It's important to point out mainly during the, the COVID crisis. And most important, and highlight the interest, the national interest of the major central bank in the provision of liquidity through swaps. In this case, it's mainly for the US, US central bank, the Federal Reserve, that uh, if you see the, the graph that uh, is shown in the, in the paper, the, the main uh, change in the swap was done by the, the Federal Reserve, even the other central bank has offered as well, but the change has been done by the Federal Reserve. And points out to the need of more structural measures, such as debt relief, then liquidity measure for, for low income countries in crisis situation. I was mentioned that we have a, a multi-dimensional crisis for those countries, food, energy, financial stability, liquidity, and, and climate change. So it's, I think it's more, it's necessary to point out more structural measures than only liquid measure. Um, the GFSN tracker uh, can be very useful to prevent a balance of payment crisis because if you, if you know more or less where the, the, the source of liquidity can, can come, you can manage um, um, in a successful way the, the probability 
to to prevent the bills of payment crisis mainly for the poor countries for the low income countries um finally so uh kind of is discussed because it i understand this this indicator you no know, this the safety net is a work in progress i think this in the reform dgfsn can push some change mainly in the imf lending procedure in order to address some structural inequalities among countries so that's the major point i would like to, to do some comments on so as the global financial safety net and in fact reserves in emerging markets some consideration um first what, what the paper uh point out and i will do in next slide my, my comments so there is no role for effect reserves in this safety net because uh for exchange reserves are not in a resource in contrast to to the safety net resource that are provided from non-national bilateral regional or global institutional arrangements so the the understand of effect reserve is understood as a national resource that's the reason is not included in this indicator in the theoretical level what's the reason they um, put in theoretical level the, a very famous economist maurice hobsfeld and said, see, you know, all types of balance of payment crisis in the emerging markets developed economies, the third party actor must come from outside the country and provide timely, voluminous, and smoothly decided conditionality and this is decisive action to combat your crisis. That's, I understand that's the, the justification in a more theoretical level. Consequently, for crisis prevention and resolution, the fact that crisis finance is provided from outside the countries by non-market actors is the major distinction between the GFSN and National Foreign Reserve. Uh, some comments. Yes, so although effects reserve are national resource in general, they have been used to, to maintain, to keep the access to global financial market by not only the big, the, the the high position of emerging markets, but for as well the, the, the developing countries. And in some way, the main theoretical reference, the Obsfeld's 1996, predates the process of reserve accumulation in middle income and developing, in developing economy, which start after the consequence of the huge crisis in, in emerging and developing country between the end of 90s and beginning of 2000. So um, why this? Because reserve accumulation by those countries can be seen as a key development in the global finance spheres in the last decades. So, and has changed the integration of those economies into international financial system, promotes the, the process of financialization. In this way, the, the reserve accumulation, if you, if you if you ask me what's the one of the major events in the global finance, I would say is the huge accumulation of reserve accumulation by all countries, even the, the poor country has have been accumulated, even the, the lower income countries have accumulated re reserves. It was the way that was addressed um, the crisis of end of 90s and beginning of 2000. There is other uh, issues uh, that I, I have been discussing in my, my book that, that just come out, the financialization in emerging countries and change in central bank, which tackle exactly the, the major change in the global in financial system from the point of view of the emerging countries. Yeah. So uh, in, in, the, in, in the dialogue with this the research paper, because in some way, because the paper mentioned that the importance of the currency swap lines. And the, the major change in the currency swap line among of the major center bank was the Federal Reserve. And if you consider the emerging markets 
that was allowed to access these uh, swap lines in the Federal Reserve, you can see that it was Brazil, Korea, and Mexico. And these, those countries, they hold large reserves. Of course, it's a change in the, between dollar and the, the, the national currency, but in some way, they not, have considered not only the national interest, but the fact that those countries hold large reserves. Um, I think uh, changes in the global financial system of the last decades, particularly the reserve accumulation in the emerging markets in developed economies may require a different approach for fractal reserves in the global financial uh, safety net. As an idea, as I, I'm going to discuss in, in, the, in, in the next, the next slide, is to, to reinforce this kind of regional financial arrangement for low income countries could be host to a pool of reserves. Because it, it, it's, it's, it would take a, a, a much time, but the, the connection, because in the research paper mentioned that the, the swap lines offered by US and China is related to financial, to bank interest, to trade interest, maybe. Uh, in other countries with less development financial system, you could use uh, in a better way the pool of reserve that those countries have if they are organized in regional financial ar arrangements, a kind of pool of reserve for, for, for those countries. Related to this, uh, it's point out that is the, the first graph the yeah, first figure in the paper is the change in the global financial safety net since the, the end of the Second World War. We, you can see the declining role of the IMF in the rise importance of the major central banks, mainly the, the US central bank. So in some way, you, the global financial has changed a lot, like we know. So uh, the have been offered some kind of global instruments. In this case, it's mainly uh, swaps, but not only swaps. In the COVID crisis, the, the, there, is, there has, has been an implementation of new tools of the Federal Reserve for monetary authorities during the crisis. I'm calling for the Foreign International Monetary Authority, FEMA, the FEMA repo facility. Uh, What's this uh, facility? And it was a kind of temporary facility to offer the, the monetary territory who had account in the Federal Reserve of New York, a kind of uh, liquidity facility in the Federal Reserve. In this sense, in this facility, which it was implemented in 2020, and had just became a permanent tool by the middle of the last year, the central bank can use their US treasury portfolio holders in repo operation with the Federal Reserve to mitigate liquidity pressure in US dollar funding markets. More specifically, the central banks, the central bank that can access the Federal Reserve balance sheet, they can, they can use their reserve in this operation. It's important to mention that these FEMA repo facilities became a permanent liquidity tool by July the 21. So it's a, 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 a fake, it's important to, to consider this, this facility because um, the global financial has changed a lot. So I think it's, it's important to consider those um, global tools. No? Um, Juan Pablo, I'm so sorry. I wonder if you could perhaps draw to a close in the next two or three minutes, just okay. so that we also have a little bit of time for questions at the end. Okay, sorry. Thank you so much. Uh, so, yes, ju just to, to think because I, I, I lost the, the, the clock here. Uh, so, the, in some way, the increasing role of the major central bank, the global fund, it should be um, taking in account not only to swaps, but the consideration of, of reserves. And finally, 
the cost of liquidity facilities matters. I think it's, it's, it would be useful, might be useful to highlight this aspect in the global financial safety net. And to, to, to the to last point, I think would put more pressure in the global financial banks like the Federal Reserve, the ECB, to change some uh, liquidity uh, facilities, mainly take advantage of the Federal Reserve's now in the new monetary framework, which consider the question of inequality in these in those operations. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was a really excellent intervention in terms of thinking differently and adding new ideas to um, to what has been presented. So thank you very, very much. We really appreciate that input. And we turn now uh, to Candelaria uh, Alvarez Moroni, who is a distinguished visitor from Argentina, really with a view to try and explain to us the experience of a country accessing that global financial safety net. Welcome, Candelaria. Thank you, Penelope, and thank you, uh... Ujad for inviting me. This is a great event and we are really, really pleased to be here today. Um, also, I wanted to thank uh, Richard and Kevin for their opening remarks, which will kind of pave the way for my intervention and Barbara and Larissa for their excellent previous presentation as well as uh, Juan Pablo. Um, so I think this is a huge, important topic and it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to, to discuss the challenges that the GFSN presents today. Um, these two last years have shown how important it is for countries to come with the support when needed, um, but also that some of the institutions that we already have and which we should count on need to be revised and renewed uh, because uh, the world in which they, we live today doesn't resemble the one in which they were created in 1940 for some of, the, of these institutions. So the, the balance of power in the world has changed and with it the role of countries, regions and, the, and multi multilateralism. So we just want to focus my remarks in kind of three main issues uh, today. The first one, commenting on the paper, which we found really important and interesting, and it, it gave a lot of uh, food for thought for policymakers. And which I think the main uh, highlight is that uh, the current GFSN as it is, doesn't guarantee the safety net for all countries. And, and I think uh, Larissa and Barbara made an excellent point uh, mentioning this. Then I would like to, to mention the, the how the middle income countries low and middle income countries don't have access to it, maybe kind of portray a little bit of Argentina's experience during the pandemic. And finally, uh, what we think from Argentina would be the kind of the, the required changes uh, we might need in the system to, to um, have emerging market countries access to the global financial safety net. So first I would like to say that the COVID-19 pandemic and now the war in Ukraine has put the GFSN at test and, and left us with a complicated landscape where pre-existing uh, structural gaps were widened. That vulnerabilities are worsening, not only in DSSI eligible countries, and, and Richard, you mentioned the, the DSSI, so uh, I just wanted to bring this up. Uh, uh, um, but it's not only on those countries, but also in the in most developing countries. As pointed out in, in April's WIO, uh, that reached an 18 years high into 2021 due to the COVID-19 crisis and liquidity pressures will be felt again in 2022 due to the restart of debt services payments and the resurgence of inflation in the global um, at the global level. So as it's correctly mentioned in the paper, the GFSN fell short on the financial needs of many countries since it lacked sufficient liquidity and did not have the adequate toolkit to prevent and mitigate crisis. Uh, this result resulted in an uneven response to of, uh, of, uh, <laughs> an even crisis response capacity of the GFSN, resulting in increased financial vulnerabilities for developing countries. So, and, and as was perfectly showed, uh, while advanced economies can safeguard their economies much better since they take uh, part in this bilateral um, uh, central bank currency swaps network that offers liquidity immediately, low income countries and middle income countries have less access to this type of financing. Um, so I think that the, the important point here to mention is that even though we have um, a, a different landscape in the GFSN, uh, that we didn't have in, in the past. So we kind of had a proliferation of 
regional financial agreements, and then you had uh, bilateral swaps that can be accessed by uh, high income countries or middle high middle income countries with high access to it. Uh, you have a lot of countries that don't have access uh, to this kind of of, of uh, financial safety net. So um, during the pandemic, a lot of, of alternatives were thought to kind of address these issues, to address that vulnerabilities. And the common framework, and this was mentioned by Richard too, was created. It has a lot of shortcomings uh, from what we from where we stand, and it has doesn't. And there are a lot of discussions that are going on right now on in, on its implementation issues. But it has, and what we think it's most important, it has a lot of design issues that were not addressed, and that we could tell a lot of low-income countries to access it. So even though uh, during the pandemic you had, so you have high-income countries that can access a lot of uh, liquidity, and then you had a lot of initiatives that were thought for low-income countries. These initiatives for low-income countries are not really accessible, accessible for them. Common frameworks, as Richard mentioned, has only three countries that have requested it. Um, and probably the design problem, problems that we see had to do with that they, that they request an IMF UCT program to access, and then you have uh, one major problem from where we stand, that it has to do with, uh, with the, the, the environment where this the common framework operates, um, and, it, and it has to do with the role of credit rating agencies. So countries do not want to ask for the common framework since they probably will have a downgrade. So this is, uh, if we don't kind of uh, address this issue of procyclicality, uh, the common framework will probably not serve its purpose. So during the pandemic, and this uh, was also mentioned, there were other initiatives to try to tackle the issue of liquidity. We had the uh, SDR allocation, which was a major one. It was really important for a lot of countries to, to kind of try to access to this liquidity. But as, but as was mentioned by um, by Barbara as well and by Richard, this general allocation didn't reach the countries that really needed it. And um, and I will come to this in, in two minutes, but the, the truth is um, the G7 received 43.5 of the allocation and Latin America only received 7.6, while low-income countries received directly only 3% of this allocation. So even though it was huge in amount and it meant a lot of liquidity for the moment when we kind of pushed for this SDR allocation to happen, it didn't really reach the countries that really needed it. So um, at the multilateral level, at the G20 and another fora, we started kind of pushing to see how we could reallocate this. And then the PRGT and the RST, the, um, uh, the, the Resilience and Sustainability Fund from the fund was created. And once again, we have kind of the same issue. We had the PRGT that it's for low-income countries and it's being replenished and it might uh, probably at some point reach these countries. But then you have the RST that we thought that it might kind of reach the rest of the countries that are, that are in need, that are not touched by the PRGT. But then again, it has a lot of shortcomings, even though we completely uh, kind of pushed forward for the idea of having these kind of reallocations. And we thought it would be great to have SDRs reallocated and we kind of pushed for the RST to happen. But then when it did come to its uh, final details on the writing, it has access limits of 150% of quotas or 1 billion SDRs, which are raised lower. So it's clearly insufficient for a lot of the lower middle income countries um, that have higher quotas and these amounts will not kind of uh, serve the purpose to cover their financial needs. So there were a lot of uh, initiatives that were pushed forward and you had, and you already had the high income countries um, Kind of covered with the GFSN as it was with the bilateral um, credit swap lines and with the uh, IMF, and then you had all these initiatives for low-income countries. Uh, that, and again, I can say that it, I, at least from my standpoint, and this is a personal view, that didn't really reach them. But you had a lot of the middle-income countries that were not thought on, and then again, uh, they were not reached with any kind of help. So. And we talk about, and when we talk about middle-income countries, we do have an issue on that needs to be tackled since they are kind of the the their home for seventy five percent of the population, sixty two percent of the world poor, and they probably if they are not 
attended or addressed their needs, um, they will curtail the possibility of the global growth to really happen and, and be um, sustainable in the long term. So um, this forgotten middle uh, and jeopardizing their need to, to grow may jeopardize the, dynas the dynamism of the recovery globally. And so since I'm touching upon the middle income countries, I will just be very brief on Argentina and during the pandemic, before the pandemic, we were already on, on a debt distress. We had to restructure our debt with private, and we had an IMF program that had failed. And um, we first restructured the, the debt with the private sector, then had a conversations with the IMF, which we landed two months ago or, or so with a new IMF program. Um, so I cannot say that we don't, do not have access to the global financial safety nets. And I think um, Larissa mentioned that we do have a credit line swap with, uh, with China, which is true. So Argentina is a case in which for a, a middle income country, we do have access uh, to, to global financial safety nets, which doesn't mean that we don't think that what we have today needs to be revised. Um, and I think it was really important, all the presentations that were be made before me, um, and the main things that we need to, to kind of, or I, I think we have to extract from it, there are a lot of avenues we need to analyze on how to move forward. But the truth is that, that the multilateral institutions give to a lot of low-income countries the possibility that bilateral credit lines don't give and RFAs sometimes leave them um, out of the equation. So if we think about multilateral institutions, we need to mention that they really need to be um, renewed, changed, and addressed all the, all the shortcomings they have. Uh, the main idea, and I will be very, very short here, but we do think that the IMF needs to be revised, that uh, a quota review is needed. If a quota review is done with a new quota formula and emerging market economies, and low-income countries can kind of uh, portray their dynamism during the last years in the quota and probably an SDR allocation as we did in the, as we had in the past would have gotten to them directly and not had to have to work on rechanneling the SDRs that reached the, the, the richer countries and that they didn't need it. So that's one of the main ideas that needs to be re re kind of pushed forward and the G24 completely points this out for the last I think G24, in G24, we push for this like forever, which is really, really relevant. The other thing is, I think, Barbara, you mentioned it, is thinking on the fund having a different type of facility. So the RST was a, a good step in the right direction, but then it, when you had the, the access limits uh, was complicated. So you need to start thinking on having something that's different, that it's unconditional, that could have longer terms and that could really serve the purpose for the low income and middle income countries. And then the last point I will touch upon uh, really briefly is on governance issues on the IMF and on its uh, modalities more structurally. Argentina is, has been pushing for a surcharges revision, which is a policy that charges on, uh, on countries that have um, lending uh, facilities when they surpass a, a time or, a, or, or an amount of money they require, they have to pay. And these surcharges has been, have been um, um, covering for the operational incomes of the, of the fund in the last years. So it's really, really uh, needed that countries that go to the fund when they don't really want to go to the fund then and paying for the operational income of these institutions. So this is some of the things that we think that need to be uh, tackled in the future. So. These are my main comments. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you very much for that experience um, of actually explaining to us how, as a middle income country, you had some access, but really not enough when you most needed it. Um, we have an opportunity now to open to the floor, and I would welcome um, any questions from those who are here. You may, in fact, um, raise your hand and then unmute yourself and ask a question. Um, in the meanwhile, I'm going to just raise some of the questions that were highlighted um, as people registered for the session. And I'd like to focus perhaps on uh, a couple of these questions. Um, the first one, what can be done to better align the global safety net 
uh, financial safety net with the interests of developing countries. And I guess this may also have something to do with the voice uh, of developing countries. Um, another question was, do you have any specific idea as to why the RFAs were not used and which countries did use them? We've had some real useful input from Barbara uh, in the session, but it may be that there's additional things that you might want to mention, uh, Barbara or anybody else in the session. Um, and then this issue of, is there any way in which it might be useful for the narrative to link um, the global financial safety net to the achievement um, of the SDGs or part thereof? Um, those are some questions that came from the floor before we started the session. I don't know if anybody has anything else uh, to raise. Um, I'll give you a minute or two and just mention that in the chat, please do have a look at the link to the, um, the paper, uh, which is on the project website, and also the link to the tracker. And there is also a link to a new book by Richard and Kevin. So there's lots to see in the chat. Um, Kevin, I see you have raised your hand. Yeah, well, first of all, thanks so much for great presentations. And again, big round of applause to uh, to the researchers on this and and uh, incredible insights by Juan Pablo and Candelaria. I, I want to point out one one thing that isn't in the paper and that maybe in the in the in the next rendition of it with the next uh, next update, it might be something to explore and to highlight. You folks uh, correctly show that a the scale isn't there, uh, and b that the that the patch it, it's a patchwork and it's incomplete uh, with real gaps in the in the system. I think one other thing I I would I would highlight is that it's it's also misaligned that the that they go in different directions. And, and what do I mean by that? I'd say that in two levels. First of all, when the central banks of the advanced economies put in place their swaps. That's what often in the past two times they've done this at any level of magnitude in 2008 and again in 2020, that's what triggers a safe haven capital flight to the north, right? And so by, by the safety net stabilizing the north, it destabilizes the south even more. And I, and I don't feel sort of, I feel like we need to, there, there's lots of research at the BIS and the, and the Bank of England that have shown that, that obviously that's what's happened. And so the, 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 the swaps in the north trigger the need to go to this inadequate uh, system in the south. So that's the, the first sort of core systemic uh, misalignment uh, of the system. And then the second one is, is when the south does activate the, um, the uh, uh, what they do have at their disposal, mostly the IMF for everybody, and in certain cases, um, in certain cases, these these uh, RFAs, which with all except for the FLAR, I think, uh, are basically linked to linked to IMF programs, is that the the northern advanced economy responses are counter cyclical, right? They're usually doing expansionary monetary and fiscal policy at home, coupled with these swaps, right? Whereas the southern ones are pro-cyclical, uh, so that's a second source of uh, uh, second source of, of misalignment that puts more of a drag on the south, and ultimately actually puts a drag on global global growth, as Jose Antonio Campo points out in his uh, his landmark book on on uh, on the on the non on the non system. So those those two asymmetries are or misalignments are are really important. It's not that the that all of these things work together, and you folks do stress the need for coordination. I'll try to to answer Penelope's call on on, on some level. I think uh, I think what what uh, my recommendations would be for for developing countries would be to do two things. Fundamentally, is a create more of your own institutions that are delinked from the fund, and b use that as sort of political leverage to punch against your uh, your IMF quota weight and 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 the representation that you have in these institutions to leverage more what you want and and uh, and I would I would suggest that uh, one of the key things has been a G24 proposal for a uh, a linked swap line that goes into the fund that is unconditional. So I would uh, 
I would, for in the case of Africa, for those countries that are not part of the Arab Monetary Fund, which is a huge amount of them, uh, Bill Kring and others have, have written that there's actually an African Monetary Fund that was negotiated. All of the details are, are set, but it's only been ratified and signed by, it's only been signed by uh, a small amount of the membership. Of course, there are no position to capitalize it now, but when and if they ever get back to that, it would be important to create the African Monetary Fund. It would be important to delink the Chiang Mai Initiative and the Arab Monetary Fund <clears throat> from, uh, from the International Monetary Fund and to delink de and to wake up, uh, and this is sort of a question for Juan Pablo, is like wh where is the contingent reserve arrangement uh, to delink that from the, from, this, from the fund and to, and to wake it up and to, and to, and to stand it up? What we know um, in the politics of the creation of the New Development Bank and the contingent reserve arrangement uh, back when it did is when the BRICS were connected on that and they were creating those institutions, that gave them so much more leverage at the fund and the small capital increases that they were able to get and the quota changes that were happened were not because they were asking and point in doing studies by nerds like us showing that their economies have grown it was a, uh, a realization among the major shareholders that, oh my gosh, if we don't uh, create more room for them within, they're gonna create more of this stuff outside. And so using that sort of political economic dynamic to create and have more autonomy on your own institutions, can, it, can one help serve you and create a larger and more effective menu of different kinds of instruments that you can use on your own, but can also give you more leverage against my country and the, and, and the Western countries within it. And they, they realize they, they sort of want control. And so they're more willing to give you what you want if they realize you might be able to get it somewhere else. And so cautious and careful coalitions with China are key here, um, but also all of these other institutions would, would be key. I'll, I'll put a, a note in the chat um, uh, about a, the proposal for this swap line. I know that the developing countries have asked for this and the G24 have asked for this. Unfortunately, they sort of got it. Uh, with one big exception in April of 2022, the fund and uh, the North said, no, we're not gonna allow a, a linked swap line so that the fund can give swap lines uh, unconditionally, but we'll create this, uh, this uh, SS, SLL, what's it called? The short-term liquidity line, uh, which was came out of that push. Uh, unfortunately, that's just a, one, a, yet another uh, credit line and it, and it has never been used. Uh, at the fund, no, no, of all the 172 billion, if I get your number right, Larissa, uh, of, of drawing on the fund uh, since, since March of 2020, uh, not one country requested to use the SLL. Uh, in this report I'll put in, unfortunately, I don't have the different chapters separated out, but the article by Ted Truman uh, outlines the different options on how you would link the fund IMF to, uh, to a swap-like arrangement. Thanks. Thanks, Kevin. Um, very useful inputs. Larissa, you have your hand up. Thank you very much. Um, and actually, I wanted to respond to the question why RFAs have not been used and which countries did use them. But Kevin answered this question all right, already quite comprehensively. I just wanted to add that um, this question has to be raised, I think, um, more in a more nuanced way because those funds have been used. It has just not been the voluminous ones that have been used. And Barbara and I put out in a paper published in 2020 how this relates to their governance structure. And this is what Kevin just highlighted. Those that are autonomous are of small volume. Those that are not autonomous from IMF or the institutions have the large volume to tap on. So the, there, there lies some key to how to address, for example, also low-income country interests is about putting up their own institutions, but also, as Kevin said, um, looking at those that are used in order to learn about the governance structure, capital share structure, etc. Um, so this is one, one response, I think. Yes, it has been a small, small fraction, but this has to do with which funds have been used. And it has been large countries, actually, that draw on their regional funds. And this is the second point. They drew on these very small volumes that are immediately accessible without conditionality. So this is what the regional funds can offer. And if they can, you know, reform this 
part, as be it through a guarantee system, be it through other market access, be it through um, different instruments that we can think about, then maybe this is um, this can be raised, like this share can be raised. Um, and last point, um, this is exactly, Kevin, what I wanted to point out to if you see how, how large this share is of unconditional lending that the IMF has given out during COVID-19 and also uh, yes, then we can see um, what countries demand. If they go to the IMF and they don't avoid it, then they use those funds. And they have only been temporarily reformed, as um, uh, Kalilari also pointed out. There has been some reform processes, but they do not go far enough. And yes, we do not have any use of this new swap line instrument, but this is the third part I wanted to make. I think we can learn from these bilateral swap instruments in order to know what needs to be reformed and how and what we have seen until now is not sufficient and does not reach um, the level that would need uh, that we would need I think to see more use of those multilateral funds um, finally thanks to our uh, comments uh, by Juan Pablo and Candelaria and also by to Kevin and these are very useful to further develop um, the instrument and also the analytical thinking about what we can use this database for now thank you very much Thank you very much. Um, I see Barbara. Okay, thanks a lot um, for the comments, for all of these. Um, Larissa already responded part of that. Uh, to your point, Kevin, that um, the IMF global monetary policy of expanding US dollar liquidity to major advanced economies um, destabilizes uh, the South and stabilizes the North. The idea of the Fed is that this provision of US liquidity might stabilize the global system. But what we know from other cycles is that it most probably is uh, exacerbating uh, global liquidity cycles, that in the expansion of Federal Reserve US liquidity at the advanced economies level, we will have more capital flows pro-cyclically to the global south. And then when policy change, policy standards at the Federal Reserve change, then we have a reversal of these capital flows. So this is something really important. There has been discussions on it that national central banks, especially the big central banks, have to consider the global effects of their national uh, monetary policies. But there's very little discussion on this huge new global instrument of the Federal Reserve, which is with, with this global and unequal effect. So I would like to further reinforce that point. Um, so, and, and this is the point Juan Pablo Pancera also, uh, also mentioned. Um, then um, the question from the, from before um, the, uh, the webinar started, if there would be a link of the global financial safety net with uh, SDGs. There is certainly a link because first we know uh, that countries which run into financial crisis, which are not tackled adequately, very quickly and with sufficient uh, and adequate and cheap liquidity, run further down in financial crisis. There's a very strong risk of uh, augmentation of financial crisis when they are not tackled adequately. And then there's no way to respond to societal needs, to environmental needs, et cetera. So it worsens the position of countries to engage in the SDGs. Um, my last point to Candelaria, I think what you what you mentioned, the forgotten, forgotten middle income country support, which is so key uh, at global uh, at global at the global level, this is something I think we have to push in in the policy agenda that most of the instruments uh, discussed currently address, for example, low income countries, not even the middle income countries. So this is a large agenda. Thank you. Thank you very much. I see Juan Pablo and Candelaria want to say something. There is also um, a question in the chat. This is Kevin. Um, the other question about the CB swaps in the north, we know in the short term it's detrimental to emerging markets in terms of the flight to safety, but I wonder in the immediate term, does it lower the cost of capital for uh, emerging market economies in the intermediate term? Just a thought that he raises. Juan Pablo, over to you first, if you could keep your comments short, because we obviously need to allow for Candelaria. We've only got uh, four or five minutes. Thank you very much. Okay. 
will be short. It's just to mention the the Brazilian experience in the with the swap lines. Yeah. So uh, the Brazilian central bank did not access the swap lines. What are the reason not to do it? So it's basically the cost, the cost of the line. Yeah. That's I'm saying that in the GFS and the COVID, in the, in the COVID crisis, because this was opened in the GFS in 2008. So mainly the cost, and now because of the other facilities, the Ripple and the FEMA uh, Ripple facilities. Though the San Brazilian Bank, if they have to, to do this, they prefer to those facilities, which is very different from the other uh, emerging countries that, like Mexico and Korea, they took these uh, swap lines, a huge amount of this, maybe because they are more connected to the US financial system than the Brazilian one. So it, it, the, one, the, the small comment one the Kevin mentioned is the, the misalignments in the, the global financial system. Yes, you're right. The, the swap line triggers a kind of capital outflow from the south to the north. But uh, it's, I wouldn't use a trigger because I maybe the reinforce because it, this kind of capital flow would be there in any way. So the question is, it stabilizes or destabilizing? So uh, this, this outflow, that's it, thanks. Thank you, Penelope. So I, I'm just going to be really, really brief. I have two points, uh, small points to make here. The first one is on the changes that need to be done and how to make them. So I do think that we, as emerging market economies, need to use the spaces wh where we are uh, in a better way. So we do have the possibility to see what the initiatives are when they're being changed, at least for some of, our, uh, of us as Argentina, I mean. Uh, but then again, since we don't have the uh, coordination mechanisms that a lot of uh, advanced economies do have, we tend to see initiatives once they have been finalized and have been designed by countries that don't that won't be using them. So at the end of the day, we end up with initiatives that have details that are that are supposed to be kind of covering for the needs of low income countries or middle income countries, but no low income country or middle income country was involved in the design. So it makes it are really difficult after that to be used. And this is kind of a, a point that I make for myself. We do need to kind of use the spaces where we are and coordinate between emerging market economies because we need to raise our voice in a, in a coordinated manner to make it uh, heard. So we have the G24, we have UNCTAD, we have different spaces where we kind of could uh, make better stripes to kind of have initiatives that are good. But I think that since we are in the middle of a lot of uh, tensions, we don't usually uh, use it correctly to kind of raise the voice uh, in, a, in a coordinated manner. And on the other side, you have a lot of countries that do have space and do have the, the, the coordination uh, efforts already done. And it's uh, I, I, just a, a foot forward, I do think that emerging market economies and low-income countries need to coordinate better and, and kind of raise their voice in a, in a coordinated manner. And then just really brief on SDG alignment. I completely agree that we need to work on SDGs. The thing that when we were discussing the kind of initiatives on debt and um, on liquidity, if you try to set, if you try to kind of set a corset over how the countries that need the money need to use it, it will probably not help them as much as it needed. So we need to cover for SDGs. We need to give uh, space, and of course, we completely agree that we need to to. Um, uh, kind of elevate to SDG goals. But then again, we don't need uh, kind of the new initiatives to only be tailored made to cover that needs. Uh, there are a lot of countries that need um, to cover food, housing, kind of and, and a lot of issues that are not covered directly by the SDGs. And if we tailor made the initiatives we do just to cover that as advanced countries wanted, it would be really not as useful as it should be. So these are my two thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And very sadly, at the end of this very fascinating conversation and energized conversation, 
I'm afraid we have to come to an end, but thank you to all of you. Those of you who exit, please, if you wouldn't mind just filling in the short survey. And we really appreciate the, the inputs and the thoughts and the dynamism of each one of you. Thank you very, very much. Bye-bye. Thank you.